The Square Ball Podcast. Welcome to the show. Levi Solicitors bring you this one, the TSB Guide to Max Gradle. Dan here with Michael and with Rob as we offer you 10% discount on your legal fees. LeviSolicitors.co.uk forward slash the square ball. We're going to get on to Max Gradle's professional negligence against Bristol in a bit. Was there some dispute resolution involved? Is that the role of was that the role of Beckford and Doyle? I'm not sure exactly who was trying to resolve that at the time. Do but, Levi? Uh, but that's that's definitely an advert. And if the owner of a business was asset stripping and just selling off anything that was wasn't nailed down, did Levi? Could they deal with that? Probably. Maybe help. Let's yeah. assume so, shall Let's we? Let's assume so. LeviSolicitors.co.uk forward slash the square ball. Max Gradle is the the subject today. Um, this one coming out on the day that his Ivory Coast, the Cote d'Ivoire, are playing a friendly in Lons. Where? Law, as uh, as Moscow <laughs> would say, in I believe that's in Fran. Fran, yeah, we yeah. Uh, ag- against Marcelo Bielsa's Uruguay. So it's nice to see like the worlds, worlds colliding like that. Uh, but yeah, it's probably long overdue to have a little chat about about Maxi because we still hold him very dear in our hearts, don't we? And I think we were all kind of quietly pleased when Ivory Coast won Afcon recently. Max Grade will be one of your um, your sort of childhood heroes, almost, won't he, Rob? Given your age, yeah, he was um, part of that team that was very lovable, and it was subsequently completely heartbreaking to see it just sold off very cheaply. But yeah, while it was there, it was very, very fun, and Max Grayler was a big part of that. So he signed. It was initially on loan, wasn't it? One month loan, October two thousand and nine, and he came from being this kind of player just milling around in Leicester's reserves or whatever, to being this amazing flair player who we all loved and we all wanted to keep and for whatever reason, Leicester let us. Yeah, I mean, he played for them and it was Nigel Pearson in charge, I think, at the time. And um, yeah, he'd had a decent number of games for him, but obviously just didn't rate him particularly highly. And it, I think it's probably also fair to say that when he did arrive at Leeds on loan, most people went, who? Because <laughs> we did have quite a few loan players around this time. It was, it was during the era of the emergency loan window, which was not an emergency at all. It was just a way of getting people. Yeah. Um, or outside of transfer windows, but he signed on the same day as Sam Vokes, who people had heard of. And so the two of them went straight into the squad, but it was not announced as far as I'm aware. I think it was just... Just kind you, of happened. You sort of turned up at Ellen Road and it was like, who's on the bench? Oh, oh, yeah, new people. Well, so was that part of the the allure when it came to Gradle, do you think? The fact that he went from this position of obscurity and just was just, just dropped into the team to make it an instant impact and that shouldn't happen and you think that as soon as he makes the instant impact Leicester are going to go oh well you can't have him <laughs> we're going to keep him you kind of forget how bad a lot of those games in League One were where it could just be essentially 90 minutes of head tennis in the centre circle I seem to remember going to Ellen Road and that was kind of the case a few times whereas he would well quite often come off the bench I guess and was just immediately quick and exciting and it was like why is this guy? It was like that. Whenever a, a really good player turned up at Leeds, you're like, why is he playing for us at this yeah. level? But it was he was basically playing for us because he was good mates with Paddy Kisnarbo and it was Kisnarbo who convinced Grayson to sign him. Grayson had never, wasn't interested, hadn't made an approach to Leicester and Gradle just kept pestering Kisnarbo who kept pestering Grayson and eventually was like, fine, we'll have a look at him for a month, I guess. Ah, I never knew that, you know. And he was, um, I mean, his debut as well, he comes on that day and it's the, it's quite a, memorable game I guess it's the one where we beat Norwich in the last minute because there's a miscued goal kick Beckford latches onto it kind of scuffs the shot but it goes in and it's it was a chaotic sort of an evening but Gradle in that came on and actually made quite a big impact on it I can vaguely recall it at the time but I looked back at the BBC's minute by minute he's only on for comes on on the 79th minute and he's mentioned absolutely loads just winning free kicks causing him problems and that was kind of his role to begin with obviously then establishes himself in the first team but at this point he just comes on as like the the chaos factor yeah and there was a real dearth of players who could pick up the ball and run at people and beat people at that point wasn't you just you just didn't get it in the EFL at that point not Mm -hmm. not to that extent anyway yeah I suppose he was a different type of player to Snoddy wasn't he at the time Snoddy I guess you would never call quick but they uh sort of played in tandem very very nicely and I guess him and Snodgrass as well fall into the same bracket of players who... And I wonder if this is the reason why, I'm talking about this, this journey you went on at Leeds, and we'll talk about Bristol in a second, but essentially being 
sort of the, the the diamonds in quite a lot of shit at that time. Just players who you could latch onto from an emotional point of view, in much the same way that we love seeing what Georgie Roots is doing more recently. And he's not I'm not saying he's an in among shit, but he stands out because he's got this unknowable kind of flair that allows him to pick up the ball and run with it. And it is a rare quantity that, isn't it? Especially like in a, in a side that's kind of built on possession and passing. Somebody just who can pick it up and what? You're just going to run past people, are you? And beat people. And to get him more or less for free. I mean, 200, I, mean I suppose on debates, 200 grand was a massive fee uh, <laughs> given how little we used to spend on, on players. But in terms of bargains, you can't really get much better than him. Yeah. I don't think for the, for this sort of, for what he gave us and for that to arrive for that kind of a fee. I said it was the Yeovil game, wasn't it? Later that month when um, he scored, came off the bench, 4-0, and we were singing Grace and Grace and sign him up. I think we were singing that more or less from his <laughs> yeah. debut, I think. I think that might, he may have even first started at, on his, um, that 10 minutes against Norwich, people got a glimpse of him and were like, yeah, all right, good. <laughs> but except for once, we actually did sign someone who was good on loan and then they turned out to be good beyond that because the, the, that's the traditional Leeds pattern, isn't it? It's really, really weird that Leicester didn't want to keep him because mm. I was looking back and there were some stories at the time that it was like Leicester issue hands off warning about a permanent deal and Gradle did actually return to Leicester for a week but then it was just basically like no I just got back to Leeds it's fine I'm like cool we'll have him that's great <laughs> I'll, I'll pay to go yeah I'll pay to go and he, he scored some pretty vital goals in the run in that season didn't he oh he did I mean towards the end of the season it was again history is almost painted Beckford as the hero of this season because he he did he gets the goal on the last day, he gets the goal against Scum. But in between those two things, he's out of the team. People are criticising him quite a lot. He's requested a transfer around the turn of the year. So there's a lot of a lot of difficulty in that period. And Gradle, who's been brought in as a winger, ends up playing as a striker. And he's he's the I suppose the catalyst for getting us back on track after we we have that horrible bit where we lose four in a row and it looks like we're completely leads in it in Richard Naylor scores a couple of, as we win at, um down at Yeovil and then Grace um Gradle's in the team and he then has a little run of run of goals and it gets us back on track to the point where we do get to the final day and it's in our hands and it's dead simple and we just need to beat Bristol and for nothing insane to happen and we will finally be promoted and in terms of the promotion you know we don't need to repeat necessarily i'll go into that much detail about what happened against bristol but not that on it <laughs> <laughs> lost it completely lost his shit but given that we did do it in the end and you know from like for example we did the um uh the promotion summer special didn't we talking about this and got the oral history for it uh from it sorry and knowing that he was he was under the basically in the dressing room, hiding under the benches, crying because he thought he'd completely blown it. Yeah, it was Andy Hughes who told that story. And it's funny how, because me and Moscow did those interviews, everyone sort of remembers it a little bit differently. Like Andy Hughes was a bit like, no, he knew he'd let us down, but we knew it was sort of time to stick together and everything. And I think I chatted to Simon Grace and he was like, yeah, I got in at half time and it was fucking mayhem. It was like everyone was just arguing, trying to kill Max. And it's like, yeah, um, but he'd obviously knew what a fuck up it was and he did he did sub subsequently say that's why he played like a crazy man the following year because he knew he had a, a lot of making up to do albeit at full time he looked like he didn't have a care in the world he was just dancing <laughs> around the pitch wasn't he it's interesting that he felt like he had an, sort of an emotional debt to us in that mm. regard he, he, the thing is with Gradley he, he did have a bit of madness in him at this point I don't think anyone thought he had this much madness <laughs> in him but it obviously got to him quite a bit and he was it's weird in the stadium that day People were annoyed at the ref rather than Gradle, is the way I remember it. <laughs> for not letting him run, letting him well, run he, he was sent off for a, a kind of an off-the-ball thing, wasn't he? It was like an off-the-ball stamp and um, in the ground, the consensus was that it was probably uh, an AFL conspiracy. Having watched it back, I mean, he doesn't do much, does he? No, it was Daniel Jones, wasn't it? Yes. The Bristol Rovers player who kind of wound him up and made a meal of it, but it was... Uh, Grayson, as they were walking off at half time, found himself next to Daniel Jones and just says, "Good luck getting off this pitch if we don't go off." <laughs> which was a masterstroke as well. If you watch the the full time whistle on that one, which I think mm. he's still he's still doing the rounds on YouTube or whatever, he has come over to the wrong side of the pitch because I think he was the full back yeah. on the far side, wasn't mm. he? So he should have been the like the left he, back and like, the right he's, side of. He's basically so. got one foot down the tunnel. Yeah, as the as injury time is being played. Yeah. But um, yeah, I, it's one of those that you look back and you go, "It probably is a red card." But also, let him off, eh? It's Max Gradle. He's yeah. only young. I'm <laughs> going up. 
<laughs> be nice. Let him stay on the pitch for the, pr- for the promotion party. But yeah, he was, he was like a man possessed in that second season, wasn't he? Completely just optimum um, Max Gradle, which unfortunately then makes him attractive for Ken Bates seeing the pound signs. Yeah, I mean, I, you say he was great that season once he gets in the team because he's obviously suspended for the start of that season, which <laughs> makes it a little bit difficult for us to get going. And I, I was looking back at this, I kind of forget how badly we started that season. There were some awful games in it before Gradle really kind of gets into gear. Like we've we've managed to lose at Bar- 5-2 at Barnsley. We've lost 4-6 against Preston. We've been done 4-0. <laughs> Is that the John Parkin game? Yeah, we've done, we've done four, been done 4-0 by Cardiff. So, And we've mid table and it feels like it's well, it feels like we're not going to go down but it feels like we're just going to be you know have a steady mid table season as a newly promoted team. Do you know what it's looking back on it as you described the, this and it's it's not that long ago it's within living memory it feels like a lifetime ago everything pre Bielsa feels like a lifetime ago anyway but you forget how much of a grind the championship is when you're coming in from the the mm. league 1 route. Even and seeing the attendance against Norwich because Norwich was the first kind of, game. We're our promotion. Yeah, Gradle's first game there. Well, they won the league, didn't they, that year? They were promotion rivals, but under 20,000 there. Right. You just think, God, we'd, we'd so easily sell that out now. Yeah. And But just at the time, there was... I mean, football's changed, and obviously the and the scale of ambition has changed, hasn't it? We've been in the Premier League, and Bielsa sort of reignited all that that kind of thing. But yeah, it goes to show how much Bates had poisoned the well, mm. doesn't it? I mean, yeah, that that um, the team at that time, once it crystallised anyway... It was such a fun team that Gradle was a massive part of that forward line of Becchio, Snodgrass, House and Gradle. It was just kind of, for a period anyway, for a few months, it did just run riot through the league. And you did think, could this actually happen? And basically Grayson just wanted to sign a defender, which Bates wouldn't let him. But, you know, it was, uh, so that didn't quite work out. But Gradle ended up winning the Player of the Year, both the Club's Player of the Year and the Yorkshire Evening Post Player of the Year. And Phil Hay, who interviewed him for The Athletic, he talks about how when he went to give Gradle the award you often find footballers aren't really that asked about these things but you could tell it really meant a lot to him and I think when he interviewed him what is it he said uh, it was an amazing year I was totally in love with football and the club totally in love with everything and it was it should have been a real feel good story that of going back up with that team again mm. but uh, at that time we weren't allowed nice things were we at least not for very long Hearing stuff like that, that's why we still love him. I think that's why we still carry him in our hearts, isn't it? The fact that he went out and lived it and redeemed himself the season after. It's the redemption arc. Yeah, and it was a fun period. I know that the season kind of started badly, ended badly, but there was a bit in the middle, which maybe is what you kind of hope for, is, is just like a bit of a season at least where you can think, you can dream a little bit and be like, oh, I think this might happen. Like, there's a very real chance we're going to go up, we're going to just bounce up again here. Well, and it's him as well. It's him that scores the two goals against Warnock's QPR mm. uh, just before Christmas, who QPR ended up walking away with the league, really. But Grail scores twice. We win 2 0, and we're second going into Christmas. And you think, bloody hell, we're in a real chance here with a really good, fun team. Yeah, mm. I mean, there's a, there's a bit we lose once in four months in the middle of that, having started with started badly. We lose at Cardiff because that, that's what happened. That's just what used <laughs> to happen. I feel like we've, are we kind of beyond that now? I feel like we've we've managed to break that haven't we've we we've broke yeah we've broken a lot of these jinxes and curses haven't we like it feels but, like, but it. like for years it was like oh yeah we'll lose at Cardiff because O'Leary's team lost there so for some reason <laughs> for some reason we have to just keep doing it I don't know I don't know why it seems like to be a, it's like a permanent thing. curse on the kingdom isn't exactly. it I know Rob Earnshaw's not playing from anymore but he'll, he'll probably do well yeah. probably beat Ian Hart for pace Kumas will be hovering somewhere around <laughs> watching in the stands Kavanagh yeah. there yeah. to uh, with his grey head ready to score <laughs> but um, but yeah that, that run of thinking like what the hell we're going to do this. We're going to do this. But then, um, yeah, we turns out we're not that good at defending. Yeah, and the, and the problem <laughs> Which with, we kind of knew all along. And I was saying, touching on the point I made before, the problem with not going up then is that we can't have nice things at Leeds because, I mean, as we know, the reality of being in the championship now is you have to sell to survive to try and um, balance the books, don't you? Because the, the tightness of FFP and PNS, whatever it is, that, you know, it feels like the EFL is trying to get its house in order in that regard. Far from a perfect system. But that's the reality of being there. Whereas it always felt like you could kind of cling on to these better players back in this era I think that's one of the key differences between then and now and to see all the good players just gradually drift away and be sold to pay for whatever shite Bates needed to pay for <laughs> we didn't cling for long did we I think it was an era of of we happened to strike upon a good side that we'd not paid any money for and the sensible thing to do would have been to well we didn't pay really anything for Snodgrass for Gradle for Becchio this is a 
a rare opportunity to just put a few players around them and go up on the cheap. On the cheap turned out to be... You even, know, ch- even cheaper op- than that. Turned yeah. out to be yeah. optimistic because actually we went, <laughs> well, all of a sudden, I think Phil still told this tale of... Um, Snodgrass going in and then saying, oh, we we see you as a £7 million player or whatever. We're not going to let you go for less. And he was like, well, do you fancy paying me like I'm a £7 million player? Then they were like, oh, no, 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 no. No, we don't. That doesn't work that way. We just want you as a, as an asset more than anything. Can, see, now you said that, I, I immediately pictured Sean Harvey, which has immediately <laughs> drawn my mind onto the Wrexham documentary and how furious I feel every time I see his face on that. I've still not watched that, but... For that reason. His presence on it can't make it good. Mm. Don't... Uh, there needs to be... Um, some sort of an expose on Sean Harvey and all his all of his um, dreadful deeds across the years, <laughs> doing Bates' as dirty work for him. Uh, but anyway, yeah. So as we know, it was sold. It was right at the end of the window, wasn't it? It's about two and a half million quid, or, or so it was reported. Um, which is it was a classic Bates move, wasn't it? Final day of the window and all that. Well, yeah. Bates had earlier said that. Well, Grayson said he wasn't for sale. Bates said we have no intention of selling our top players unless the offer is so ridiculous it will enable Simon to strengthen his team in many other ways. So then we waited until the end of the window, sold him. It was probably quite cheaply at the time for £2.5 million. And then, yeah, Bates later claimed that he'd been screwed by the agent and the exchange rate. So we actually had no money to spend on the team, <laughs> which is like, nice one, Ken. That was a very familiar story again. Yeah, the way Bates managed to explain it, it would have, I mean, it's also not true because it was Bates telling this story. Yeah. But you, you kind of heard it, the explanation and went, well, why don't we just keep him for the rest of the season then? Given we, we appear to have made no money off this deal, he's yeah. like, well... Exchange rates and the agents have been there for a couple of it. We're a new news now. We're a player. That's as good. But yeah, this was this was when we entered the era of good player leaves, freebie comes in to replace him, and lo and behold, the team gets worse as a result. What did he do after Leeds? There's the question. Then nothing at all. No. <laughs> but again, we we have kind of we've all loosely kept in touch with him and gone. Oh, we like him. Don't mean it's it's a it's an interesting thing. It's an intangible thing when a player captures the heart like they do at Leeds, and so we sort of we got the reasons there for why that happened. It's the crucial goals at the crucial time, the redemption arc, and all that. I feel like as well that era of player, there was a bit of people leaving, and you went, yeah, you do right, mate, get yeah. out, save yourself. You're almost there's, there's a certain amount of martyring these players, isn't there? Like when Snoddy left, you're like, yeah, I get it. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. I, I hope you do well because yeah. you deserve better than this. You deserve to play in a, a team with some ambition rather than. You know, with Mika Varanen, <laughs> which isn't, which it sounds like I'm slagging off him, but he was just one of those players who we brought in as like, oh, they they seem to be available and might be all right. We'll, yeah. just, we'll just try him. And Maxi went off to Saint Etienne. Quite a lot of appearances there over the four years after he left us. 31 goals in 117 appearances and won the cup, which is good for him. Um, and then there can't have been anybody who didn't see this news when you saw that he joined Bournemouth for like 7 million quid and you went oh, that's not right is it it's not it's not fair well, it was around that time that GFH used to kind of tease us going oh we might you know Gradle is a target he might be signing back and you think there's no way we could afford him idiots but it was um, when I went to the Euros in 2016 in France spent some time in Saint Etienne and was kind of just shouting Max Gradle's name in the face of locals, hoping they might have a flicker of recognition, which they didn't really. Bonjour, Max Gradle. Yeah, 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 sort of saying it in different accents. But um, <laughs> yeah, he did all right there. And then he, he went to Bournemouth, seven million quid, but then he knackered his cruciate ligament within the first month. So it never really happened for him there, because I think by the time he returned, um, they'd just signed more players, which I'm kind of glad Bournemouth didn't get to see the best of him. <laughs> they did. They, I mean, second stint at Bournemouth, wasn't he? He had a, he'd had a, he'd had a loan at um, the kind of pre- Premier League Bournemouth when they were stuck in like League One, League Two kind of mm-hmm. um, constantly in the doldrums, weren't they for ages? But yeah, he had a loan there prior to us. And then yeah, so back to Toulouse after the unsuccessful stint at Bournemouth, twenty-eight goals in ninety-six appearances over three years. So at least he got his his fitness and his form back, which is the good thing. And he ended up captain there, didn't he? By all accounts, he was their main man. He um, he scored in a relegation playoff to keep them up in their in his, their first season, and then he. They narrowly avoided relegation the second season. Again, he was kind of described as a one-man team. And then I think they were kind of cut adrift in his third season there, which is when COVID hit and the season got ended early. So they were just demoted because they didn't actually finish the season, unlike in England. Um, ended up in in Turkey alongside Samu Saiz, no less. I was really happy when I saw this. It just gave me a bit of joy that those <laughs> two played together. Again, Saiz is another one that kind of, 
even though he probably he was, wasn't as good as Gradle really, but he just gives me joy to think about some of his better games. And um, the Turkish team names as well. We, we laughed the other week, didn't we, saying these just sound made up. There just seems to always be a, a, a never, en- a never ending, <laughs> a never ending list of Turkish teams. I go, I've never heard of them, but they seem to, they seem to <laughs> yeah. have bought loads of players. Sivaspor uh, was the club that he was at first alongside Saez, and then is now at Gaziantep. Oh, of course, yeah. Which sounds like gas on tap. Um, yeah, so uh, he won winger of the season in 2020, 2021. Didn't know that was a thing. No, nope. fine. <laughs> uh, and the cup scoring in the final, no less. Um, in more to his international career, I suppose, is how we've been able to follow him since. And he's like he's like a senior statesman now, isn't he, with um, with Ivory Coast? It was insane looking at the team during the AFCON this year and thinking, bloody hell, Max Gradle is still playing for him. Because he made his debut for the Ivory Coast when he was still at Leeds. And now he's suddenly somehow got 112 caps and he's like their third most capped player. Which, again, I saw that and I was just thought, I'm really proud of you, Max, for like, <laughs> going on to have such a good career. Especially when he's beaten like, like Drogba, Yaya Toure, who are obviously higher profile players than him. But he's just been this, this stalwart now, hasn't he? He's been there and he won, won AFCON in 2015 and, and won it again for a second time this year, which is quite a gap when you think about trophy wins. Yeah, and it's not like he's just been on the fringes. He's kind of really contributed to that. He was in the team of the tournament the first time they, he won it. And then this year, he wasn't really in the team for the group stages, but that was when they were dreadful. And I think they ended up sacking the manager. Mm. And then once it got to the knockout rounds, he got put into the team. He was captain for the semi final because I think their regular captain was suspended. He sets up a goal in the semi final and he's starting in the final. And again, like, he's, it just proves that he's a really good footballer. It's the thing of um, during lockdown, they did like a watch along of the Bristol Rovers game with Andy Hughes and. Beckford, I think. And the way those pros talk about their teammates who just went on to play the top flight for however many games, you can tell just how bloody hard it is to do that Mm. and to establish yourself at that level. And Gradle's just done that ever since he's left Leeds. He's always played at the top level and contributed. I think it's nice to see his journey as well from, you know, that young lad who was going mental at a referee in League One to kind of captain in his country and winning trophies, you think. Done all right for yourself there. Yeah, and, and it's, just, it's looking into the background again, talking about why we love him, and I was asking that question before, and it's when you look into his background. So he's, he's one of 17 brothers and sisters. No telly in that house. Um, well, <laughs> well, what I like most of all is like, um, he said, I had a big family in Africa, about 17 brothers and sisters. <laughs> in fact, he's just not, he's not keeping count. It's hard to remember the names, surely. Yeah. <laughs> like that. But um, yeah, so his mum passed away when he was on loan at Bournemouth, as we were talking about there, the, the first spell um, from Leicester. So he's providing for the rest of his family, which makes you understand what kind of informed his desire to redeem himself at Leeds um, and why he gave his absolute all the season after. Because if your career's on the line and you're providing for the whole family, then the stakes are pretty high, aren't they? Well, that's why before he'd even joined Leicester, he turned down a scholarship at Arsenal and it was like Wenger and they were probably the best team in the country because Leicester had offered him a pro deal and it was like, well, that's a professional deal. I need to take that and I'm determined to make the most of it. And likewise, when he was pushing for the move to Leeds, he was offering to pay for his own hotel and use his own money just to get here and make the most of his career, which he's, he's definitely done. And probably likewise, when he went into his contract negotiation with Ken Bates, who offered him a, a £10 pay rise, he probably would have been like, well, I'm kind of looking after a lot of people here and you, I've done really well. So any chance of paying me a vaguely the going right but and it was, was never going to happen was well, it? Well he's spoken about the sort of duality of his emotions at the time when he was bre- first breaking through at Bournemouth um, but his mum died at the same time and he's saying it was strange because at the same time as all that sadness I was so happy about football I was playing senior football for the first time at Bournemouth and I was lucky to have that it made me happy even on days when I was crying like mad wild isn't it? What I mean what a journey so you've got you know the, the journey from Ivory Coast to Paris to be with his mum when he was age 10 so you've moved countries there I mean so at least you've got the native tongue when you go to to Paris but then to come to England as a teenager is wow you've had an offer to go and see him haven't you potentially yeah I need to finalise it this afternoon but there could be a spare ticket coming up for for uh, this game Uruguay <laughs> and uh, Cote d'Ivoire in Lens you just need, you've got an offer I of the ticket just need to sell this one to my wife just a slight logistical issue of being in another country yeah there is that and thankfully I got my passport my new passport. Oh, you've um, got it all lined up. Sent through, my, my old one had expired and I hadn't even realised. So it's a good job I renewed that. So we, we shall see. I may be able to report back on this in the coming days, but um, how good would he have been under Marcelo Bielsa? 
I think the work rate, along with the skill and the pace, would have been perfect for him. I think he's the one player from that era, isn't he? That you think, yeah, he'd have been amazing under Bielsa. Snoddy had the skill, Dead. not the engine. Like, <laughs> likewise, Ross McCormack, you think. Loads of skill, but maybe not mm. really the work rate there. Yeah, Becchio probably can't do the press in too much, can he? Mm. But yeah, Grayler would have been, he would have slotted in just nicely. I did like his uh, his quotes about Bielsa. He looks crazy, and they tell you he's crazy, but he's not. To me, he knows exactly what he's doing. I don't know him, but I know this. <laughs> It'll be interesting to see what Gradle does next. I think I kind of fancy him to step into management now, having having kind of come this far with his career. He's got a he's surely got enough authority, I think, that he could move into it. Maybe it's maybe it's humanitarian work. I don't know. I can almost I can almost he's got that vibe about him, the fact that he's I don't know, he just he seems he seems that way cut out, like he he wants to be he wants to help, if you know what I mean. Whether he, he becomes a spokesman or an ambassador or something like that. For he, Leeds. I was thinking more for Ivory Coast, <laughs> Ivory Coast abroad, but you know. I was going to say, there's still time to get him back at least just for one last season, even if he's just in the reserves. It's the sort of thing that if you were playing football manager and you saw him as a free agent, you're like, come on, Max, come <laughs> on. So here, here are your choices then, Max. You can either go represent Ivory Coast at a United Nations committee, maybe, or you could come host one of the lounges at Ellen Road, which do you fancy? <laughs> huh. Well, as he says, Leeds are family, Leeds are Leeds. If it was to happen one day, I couldn't be happier. So come on, let's make him happy. The Square Ball Podcast.